I keep on saying it's true that international law without politics is ineffective, but politics without respect of international law is to be criminal. And this is the reality we face today. Our guest today on Center Stage is Francesca Albanese, the United Nations Special Rapporteur in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. She's an international lawyer with a focus on human rights, migration and the displacement of refugees. Albanese has been vocal and critical of Israel and its partners. Her assessments are blunt, and when describing Israel's actions in war, she does not hold back. Francesca Albanese, Special Rapporteur to the UN on the situation of human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories. Welcome to Center Stage. Thank you. From a human rights perspective and from your position, how is this war in Gaza any different from the previous wars? It is different in the sense that it looks uh, more severe, more cruel. This is the sixth war that the people in Gaza experience uh, since uh, 2008. And uh, it has been different since the very beginning because it's different in the context, because it, it was triggered by an attack, and an attack that inflicted serious pain uh, upon Israel and Israelis. And, I mean, it has affected thousands directly or indirectly. But the reaction, Israel's reaction is absolutely unprecedented in the sense this is not the first time that Israel uh, invokes the right of self-defense, but it's like if this time it had um, lost all, uh, sen all sense of limits, all sense of restraint, and so the prin basic principles um, of humanitarian law, like the principle of distinction, proportionality, precaution in military action, mm. they've all been forfeited. Uh, ever since I started reporting on the wars on Gaza, uh, we always say this is a disproportionate uh, retaliation from Israel to whatever attack it is uh, coming from uh, from Gaza. Proportionality is something that usually is mentioned in international humanitarian law in any war. And uh, in this case, how would it be proportional? No, but it's not. It's not. First of all, uh, we shouldn't forget, Gaza was already under an unlawful blockade, which is a collective punishment. So in, in, a, in a way, um, I, I've challenged since the very beginning the logic that it was uh, an unprovoked attack which doesn't mean that what Hamas and other military groups, um, uh, Palestinian armed groups did uh, was, was all lawful. It was not because it killed, the moment you kill or target civilians, then you, you violate international law. But um, there was no justification to unleash a war against the entire population. And also the logic, the vocabulary, the language that has been used has escalated the dehumanization of the Palestinians in the sense the concept of Palestinians as human shields is not new, but it's, it's been used on steroids as of the 7th of October. So all Palestinians are in Gaza are responsible. Uh, the language that has been used uh, has been extremely offensive and derogatory. And it has resulted in a military, in a series of military operations that are totally disproportionate. I mean, Gaza, after four months, is destroyed. When you took your role in 2022, uh, you immediately lifted the, the bar high in your first report as special reporter when you recommended that UN member states should develop uh, and I quote, a plan to end the Israeli settler colonial occupation and apartheid regime. I guess you didn't make a lot of friends with that report. Uh, I'm not sure because in fact, uh, it's a report that uh, attracted a lot of attention. What I did was to bring the discussion back on the critical right that cannot be realized until Israel maintains a system of oppression through apartheid or an illegal occupation, which is the right to self-determination, the right to be free as to exist as a people. But I think that it, it, it was important to, 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 to rock the boat mm -hmm. and to also remind member states who have used the issue of uh, the two-state solution discourse as an empty mantra, hey guys, there is some content here and you cannot miss it. 
why do they keep missing it? I think there is a, and now it's exposed, I'm not saying anything that is really um, uh, unknown. There's a lot of hypocrisy in international community. This, what's going on now, it's the, uh, the, the, the epitome of double standards. It's unconscionable, the silence. I would say Western countries, but not only. Mm -hmm. Arab countries are not necessarily better. Mm -hmm. I mean, apart from a few exceptions. There is a, a, a disconnect between decision makers and reality. And reality, both reality on the ground, because there is a genocide unfolding. Either, even the ICJ has recognized the plausibility of genocide in a very short time, which is, which is very significant and no action taken. But there is also a disconnect between um, civil society and, and common, ordinary people globally who are taking the street in solidarity with Palestinians. Whatever you turn your gaze, you see people uh, expressing solidarity with the Palestinian uh, with the Palestinians and uh, and asking for a ceasefire and genocide and the political and the political landscape is paralyzed. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the ICJ uh, ruling, when they decided to take on the case, um, a lot of people, especially the people under uh, under attacks in Gaza, they were hoping and waiting for a call for a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. From a legal and international humanitarian law perspective, uh, how do you look at this decision of not calling for a ceasefire? I understand the people's deception because ceasefire is the only thing can, that can stop the slaughtering of people, mm -hmm. the carnage on a daily basis that are actually after the ICJ interim decision, in, there was even uh, an, an increasing of violence which is, which is shocking, but it, it shows the defiance mm -hmm. of Israel for international law. At the same time, if we read the, the ICJ's interim, I mean, the provisional measures, what they talk about is a ceasefire, because there is no way to comply with these, uh, with these measures other than stopping the, the indiscriminate bombing and the destruction of uh, civilian infrastructure, the killing of civilians. So the only way to fully comply with the order is uh, um, by declaring and respecting a ceasefire. What I would have expected was that the ICJ, I mean, the, in a way, the ICJ provided, the, offered the ground for the international community to change patterns, to change approach toward Israel. Mm -hmm. What we saw was the opposite. And uh, yeah, it's been a We even saw um, big powers who are, who are like the main pillars of the international community when you hold them um, a member uh, seat at the U uh, UN Security Council, you should be upholding international humanitarian law and international laws. And then you see those same powers um, diminishing uh, ICJ and doubting it. Your job, you keep repeating that your role is to keep reporting on human rights and making sure that it's being applied. Uh, how, how does this make your job easier or harder? In my position, the, the biggest challenge is that I cannot visit the occupied Palestinian territory because of uh, Israel's uh, lack, of, lack of cooperation with the mandate. Um, at the same time, you, you, I face, like many, the, an intransigence, uh, in the inter I mean, especially among Western countries, um, a lack of will of abide by international law, which I don't know if they realize the depth and the gravity of, of each day that goes by without any hope for the Palestinians without any respect for international law, because this erodes the basis for for the validity of the international um, international law based system. I mean, I keep on saying it's true that international law um, without politics is ineffective, but politics without respect of international law is to be criminal. And this is the reality we face today. No matter how many uh, arguments based on facts, based on laws you present, that you, you are criticized, highly criticized by uh, Israel, by everyone supporting it. Um, why, why do you think that? I mean, I, I, and this is the thing, people ask me, how do you cope with the attacks? I don't even
even pay attention anymore because the reality on the ground is so serious, is so monstrous, is so compelling that the only thing I care for is that there is an, an end to this and an end that is not more catastrophic than the present for the Palestinians because they have endured too much. And of course, I have a lot of compassion for the Israelis as well. But it, I mean, we should we should always be clear that the situation, there is no symmetry between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the ones without rights between the river and the sea are the Palestinians. So um, the criticism I face is from those who are biased, mm -hmm. those who do not want to see or do not want to acknowledge and do not, do not want to address this asymmetry in power and the fact that there are an entire people which is subjugated and has been subjugated for decades. But I still feel more the love and the support of the so many around the world who, who recognize this mandate and they, they see it as a sort of a lighthouse in terms of I mean, not to lose hope in the international system. It's so humbling. Um, your main concern now is for this to stop. Now there are talks about uh, a ceasefire that might uh, happen mm. in the few weeks maybe. Is it coming a bit too late? Is it going to be enough? Well, it's not going to be enough, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's necessary. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And it's necessary because until the mili military operations uh, stop, we won't see the end of the killing, mass killing in, in Gaza. But also imagine people who have been for four months under a rain of bombs, not apart from the few days of ceasefire in November, the population in Gaza has heard and, and seen the, the, the destruction really rain, pouring from the sky. So the, the level of trauma, I think it's beyond, beyond repair. We need to face this. So I'm also very concerned with the, with the day after. I'm concerned that the day after will not allow, if not handled proper, pro properly, my result in forced displacement of the Palestinians. You worked a lot on forced displacement yes. and especially Palestinian refugees. Mm. What, how do you see all these calls, even um, what Itmar Ben Gvir, uh, the national security minister of uh, Israel said, mm. we should give them incentives to leave Gaza. How do you see it from a human rights perspective? It's ethnic cleansing. It's ethnic cleansing, but this is not new. I mean, this is what Israel has uh, as signified, this is what Israel has done to the Palestinians since the very beginning. I mean, since even before existing as a state, because the first refugees uh, were displaced uh, and never allowed to return as of December 1947. So I've said from the very beginning, this war is to be the, the, the largest instance of forced displacement in Palestinians' history. And frankly, if you, need a, if you look at the displacement inside Gaza, has already been because there are 1.4 million people. Yeah, almost 1.4 million people who have been displaced from the north into the south. And there are almost 2 million people who, who are displaced in the sense they do not have a shelter. They do not have repair anymore. They are uh, either in tents or in UNRWA premises. Um, and this is unacceptable. So I've denounced that the risk I've warned against the risk of ethnic cleansing because under the fog of war, this is what Israel does. 47, 49, 1967, and this is again another instance. But also ethnic cleansing has been the, the, the late motive of Palestinians' life under Israeli occupation since the, I mean, even without wars because hundreds of thousands have been displaced over time. You just spoke of uh, UNRWA. You, throughout your career, you worked at the UNRWA, mm. and now there's this decision from major states, contributing uh, states, uh, to defund UNRWA based on accusations for only 12 employees of allegedly uh, being part of the 7th of October. The more we hear about it, the more we understand that this, some of these allegations are just like some of the uh, employees just said, we're happy we broke the prison or something similar to this. Um, is it fair? No. I'm reading what comes out from the press and the fact that probably, I mean, the allegations might not be supported by evidence. I mean, this is something that was circulated yesterday in the media and seemed to be confirmed because no one has seen the evidence that Israel claims to have. But let's assume that UNRWA staff 
participated in the 7th of October uh, attacks. Very serious, very serious. Um, there should have been an investigation, and if proven true, these people should have been terminated and then brought to justice if they were still if they're still alive. Because again, we don't. This is not what has happened. Anwar has terminated them in the interest of the agency, violating the the right of due process. Right? It did it because of the criticism against the agency. But the fact that member states have suspended funding to the agency is absolutely immoral and, in my view, also illegal. It makes no sense from a logical point of view because why would you, would you suspend, the, why would you punish the agency at such a critical moment and the agency as a whole affecting the entire Palestinian refugee population in the region at such a critical time, especially for those in Gaza? It makes no sense because why again and why now after an ICJ ruling which says that human humanitarian aid is to be assured and is to be increased at the time where genocide is probably being committed there is a risk of of complicity of this country who have an obligation not to aid and abet uh, the illegal uh, the legal actions of Israel so it's i mean i I, I wonder when I saw the, 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 the information and the number of states uh, um, going up, I'd say, have they lost their mind? But we'll see in the coming days what happens. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the smear campaigns against you, but on the other hand, uh, you are uh, like the new hero uh, of the new generation of the Gen Z. Uh, there are memes of you, uh, the, you are portrayed as the superhero of uh, human rights. Do you see that there's a generational shift, uh, not only towards Palestine, but towards upholding human rights in general? Yes, yes, but I... I'm so amazed at the youth because I, I really have, I, well, my hope for the future comes from the young people. Because you could see, I mean, and I started realizing it with Greta Thunberg, when this, the, the, the mobilization that she, is, she triggered, it's something that sort of skipped my generation in many respects, but was so easy among people of her age. And of course, I, I mean, it, it touches me, um, the idea of being inspirational to young people it makes me really, really happy. Also because they need to believe in justice. Mm -hmm. They need to believe in human rights because human rights are like an armor. But this is something that people fought and died for. This is not a concession of states. These are the, the, the this is the gain of of. Mm, people who fought against slavery, who fought for farmers' rights, for women's rights, minority rights, indigenous people's rights. So this is something that we need to keep alive. Um, and, and the future belongs to them, to young people. The other thing is being able to, I mean, human rights are for the people, not to be discussed in universities or big conferences. So, and if they do not mean, make sense for the people, they don't make sense at all. So this this unfolding I... genocide uh, caused a lot of deception for everyone who believes in human rights, uh, or I mean, the majority of people who believe in human rights, who work in international humanitarian law. Um, it, it sounds really shocking that this is happening again, even though we pledged for years that it's never going to happen again. So what does IHL now need to actually be able to stop a genocide uh, when it's happening or before it even happens? No, I mean, it's, it's clear that uh, the member states, with a few exceptions, South Africa, <laughs> with a few exceptions, have proven unable or unwilling to honor the Genocide Convention in, in convention in that part that obliges states to prevent genocide. We couldn't prevent the genocide in, uh, in Rwanda, we couldn't prevent the genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and we couldn't prevent other atrocity crimes that have taken place and are taking place right now, I will speak, in Congo, in Sudan. There are so many crises that are forgotten. And this is why I think this, this genocide is, uh, is mobilizing people globally 
for a number of reasons, because because of the double standards. And I think that people have enough, both in the global south and in the global north, mm -hmm. of these double standards perpetrated by Western countries. The second is that P Palestine epitomize this, uh, this struggle for justice and this resistance to settler colonialism. Colonialism has transformed, but settler colonialism has, most, in most of the cases, won over the native, uh, the indigenous people. In Palestine, not yet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I do believe that there is a way for Israelis and for Israeli Jews and Palestinians to to live together in that land, but it cannot happen without equality, freedom and dignity, dignity of all. And this is the struggle now. Uh, people, I mean, my fear right now is that uh, the powerful states might be pushing, in the face of a genocide, might be pushing for a return to the status quo, which is gone. It's broken forever. It's gone. And at the same time, they, they seem to be pushing for a return to the status quo ante, so yes, let's discuss about the two-state solution when it's very difficult to, to make it materialize, while what the Palestinians need, because they are claiming unity of the people in the land, the unity of the land, so it's dismantling the apartheid. This is the only way forward. Thank you very much, Francesca Albanese. Thank you.